of these that I could steal? Which one? Does it matter? I'm gonna Jacob's. Cool. Thank you. Sorry guys, didn't get the memo. I should have been more prepared. How are y'all? <laughs> I'm good, thank you, Hunter. Okie dokie. Welcome. Um, normally we would be in the series on Ephesians. Tonight we are not. It's going to be a one-off message. We will be in Psalm 42. Oh, by the way, <laughs> sorry. My name's Emma, if you don't know me. Um, I don't normally have titles for messages. I don't know. I just normally think about that. But I happen to have one today. And the title is, When You Don't Feel God. That's it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Um, before we read Psalm 42 and before we hear from God's word, would you pray with me again? Father, thank you for your word. I'm really grateful to be able to watch um, these students worship you and follow you um, week in and week out. It is a blessing to my own heart, and it brings more joy than they will know. Um, Lord, I pray that you will be honored. I pray, Lord, that your word will be sent out um, and will fall on good soil in the hearts of these students. Lord, I pray that um, we will be soft and hear from you, and I pray that our faith will be stirred once again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Psalm 42. Why are you cast down, O my soul? As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When will I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with a throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This is the word of the Lord. So a couple weeks ago, whenever Colton reached out to me and was like, hey, can you preach on December 1st? I was like, yeah, totally. And my first reaction was, yay, because it's been a minute, and I like doing this. I love looking at God's word with y'all specifically. It's always a good time. And he was like, great, you're going to be in Ephesians 6. I was like, sweet, no problem. And then quickly after that, he texts me back. He's like, oh, wait, I'm in Ephesians 6 this week, and then I'm going to do the other one, so could you just do a one-off message? Just, like, pick your own passage. And I was like, sure. And then immediately after I said sure, I was like, oh, no. (laughs) Because I had no idea what to do. Because normally in the past, whenever I've been asked to just pick a passage and preach on whatever, what I would do is I would go back and lean on what um, I've been learning with my personal time with the Lord. So if there was a passage that I've read recently that I really loved and stuck out with me, um, stuck out to me, I would share that with you. Or if there was something that I've just been learning with him in my walk, maybe I would teach on that. Or if there was something that he laid on my heart for you all specifically, I would do that. And I just kind of went into a mild panic this couple of weeks ago because it was like, oh, that hasn't happened in a really long time. I haven't had that in a very long time, so I had nothing. I had no ideas, which is not a good place to start when you're supposed to teach soon. <laughs> um, but the reason is because, quite honestly, for the last about a, around a year, I think, my personal time with Jesus, my personal communion fellowship with the Lord has not been what it's normally been like that I've experienced in the previous years of my life. It's been very dry, and it has been a really, really quiet And that's not what I'm used to because I was blessed for several years with really just fresh, inspiring, every day was a great day with the Lord, 
even if like maybe the passage I was reading that day or praying about wasn't super just, you know, applicable, it was just so sweet all the time. I always felt God was with me. Um, for example, uh, I would drive around. Anytime I'd go driving and it was over 10 minutes, I would talk to the Lord and I'd turn on some worship music. And um, he would do this really cool thing. And it was just between him and me until I showed it today. Um, where he would just like drop a lyric in my mind. I would just remember one lyric. And it might have been something I was praying about or something we had read, whatever. And then I would turn it on and it would be beautiful and it would just be this wonderful time of worship with Jesus in my car. And he did that a lot. There was like, that happened a lot. And it felt like passing notes with Jesus. It felt like he was like, hey. And it was just, it was just between him and me and it was really fun, really sweet. Um, I haven't had a note passed to me in a really long time. It's been very, very quiet. Um, people call, but I've experienced uh, different things. Um, people call it winter. People call it other things. All of them sound kind of corny, but I don't really have another way to put it. So we're just going to go with what the psalmist says in Psalm 42. He just feels dry, really, really dry in a desert. And so that's what I've been experiencing. Not a whole lot's going on. Winter works too. It just kind of looks like there's not a lot going on the surface. It feels like God has grown really, really silent. And so it hasn't been a very inspiring time with the Lord in my personal time with him. And that's the longest it's ever happened. I mean, I've experienced, I think you might have all experienced something like that where you feel like God has grown quiet or something for maybe a day or a week or a month or something. Um, it's been going on for about a year. And that's the longest it's ever happened. And it's been just odd. Um, and so when you experience that, when you feel like you and the Lord are just kind of like that, uh, you start to ask some doubtful questions because you're not used to it. And so I ask a lot of questions, um, some of which you may have asked yourself before. We don't like to ask these questions out loud, especially not in Christian public because it doesn't sound very Christian-y to ask them, but some of them went like this. Uh, what do you do when you don't feel close to God? What do you do when you feel like you have disqualified yourself? Do I not feel like God is close to me or speaking to me because I've done something wrong? Have I finally sinned too much? Do I not read my Bible enough? Would that fix it? Do I not pray enough? What do you do when the Bible isn't appetizing like it used to be? What do you do when everyone is crying during worship and you're just kind of there? What do you do when everyone loves the message but you just thought, what do you say in the conversation when everyone is sharing their inspiring, personal moments with God and you have had none recently? What do you do when someone asks you to pick the passage to teach, but nothing has stuck out to you in a year? <laughs> what do you do when you're the least inspiring Christian in the room? What do you do when your passion fades? What do you do when your faith feels weak? And at the end of it, what do you do when you don't know what to do about it? When this experience hits, when you feel like you don't feel God anymore, when you feel like he's drawn back, when you feel like he's not speaking to you, like you haven't heard from him, there's a bunch of different ways to put it. But if you feel like his presence is absent, what do you do? Do we fake it until we make it? Do we pretend like everything's okay, hide our reality out of shame? Do we live in denial just because we don't understand what's happening? Do we question God? Do we blame him? Do we just give up? Um, well, great questions. Uh, the psalmist is experiencing that in Psalm 42. We see in verses 1 and 2 that he is longing for God. He describes himself as really thirsty, parched. Um, but nowhere in the psalm is that satisfied. There is not a time where he's like, oh yes, and God has now satisfied my soul. We just have a psalmist who is just dry, waiting for God and not having an answer. Um, it sounds like he's talking to himself a little bit. We know he's praying, but it's it, like the way he's doing it, it just kind of sounds like he's talking to himself alone in his room. He asks God some questions, which are, where are you and why have you forgotten me? Um, which, those are the two questions we're going to deal with tonight. And I think if you've asked any of the questions that I might have mentioned before, I think that's like, if you feel God is absent, you ask those questions. And I think that's the first layer of questions. But I think Underneath that, even deeper, is the ultimate question of, has God left me and has he forgotten me? Um, but then he also asks another kind of question, and it's not to God. He asks a question to himself, and I think this is really crucial, and that's where I want us to spend some time on first. 
He asks himself why he is in turmoil and despairing. He questions his feelings. He expresses his feelings honestly, and then he says, but why do I feel this way? Why am I letting myself be downcast, be sad, be despairing over this? He questions his doubts in God. And he does this because he recognizes that his feelings are not fact. Your feelings are not always reality. Your feelings are good and important, and they tell you things about reality, but just because you feel a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that is exactly how it is. For example, when you react in anger to someone, um, when Will, my fiancé, just happens to make a joke or say something like, la-di-da, about whatever, but it's something that I've been like secretly insecure about or secretly worrying about and just haven't told him, and then he just breezes by it like it's just nothing. Meanwhile, I've been crippled by it. And so he says, and then I blow up in anger on him. And what, feel, what it feels like is my anger is telling me he's done something wrong. He's wronged me. But in reality, he hasn't done anything wrong. What's going on there is, oh, my anger is telling me you're insecure. You're worried about something. That's something you need to deal with on your own, girl. It's not his fault. So in the same way with our faith, when we feel like, when we feel like God isn't near, our feelings are telling us something, but that's not fact. Because if you build your faith in God on your feelings, um, it will not last because your feelings are far too fickle. They change constantly. You can't make that the foundation of your faith. And so the psalmist does something that we should be doing whenever we experience this as well. He questions himself, and then he holds the truth and compares it to what he's experiencing. So he's he's experiencing, it feels like God has left him and God has forgotten him, but he says, hey, but I know who God is, and he recites stuff like God, he knows he saves him, God loves him, God protects him, God is singing over him, even though he can't hear it, God is anchoring him, God is preserving him, like, he knows the truth, and so as he's being honest and saying, I don't feel you close, why are you absent, he also immediately says, but I still know it's true that you haven't left me, that you haven't forgotten me, so when we experience doubting questions from having an absence of God's presence, or what it feels like that, we need to do exactly what he does. We need to line up our doubts with truth. So if we just consider the two questions, um, these are some truths to hold next to that question. Um, Oh, by the way, sorry, first, side note. (laughs) You don't have to be experiencing what I'm experiencing to still ask these questions. You don't have to be in a year of dryness or even feel like God has been absent recently. Sometimes you just ask doubtful questions because... You're a human being, and you deal with doubt. Or because maybe there's an unanswered prayer, and you're doubting him. Or maybe you're going through a hard time, and you're doubting him. Regardless, we're going to do a little teeny tiny, very many, fact and feeling Q&A. So if your feeling is, has God left me? Um, The truth is this. In Deuteronomy 31.8, he says, instead, um, I never leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. I have not left you. When we ask the question, okay, it feels like he's left me. I can't feel his presence anymore. Has he forgotten me? We can remember the promise in Psalm 40, verse 5, that says, his thoughts are countless of us. He thinks of us always. He doesn't ever forget you. He is covering you in love. He sings over you constantly. And it's, it's easy to, like, say you know what's true and, like, really believe it. But that's what the psalmist is experiencing is he doesn't feel like any of it is true, but he has to preach the truth to himself or else he will despair or else he will give up in faith in God. Whenever you don't feel like God is as close to you as he has been before or if like he's not speaking to you, if you've ever experienced that, that's a normal thing to experience. Sometimes it feels like something's wrong with me. I'm not a good Christian. I'm not spiritual enough. I don't feel God in my life. Um, But it's normal that will most likely, if it hasn't happened to you, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, um, but it will most likely happen at some point you won't sense and experience time with God like you're used to. When you ask doubting questions like this, that's normal. It's not something to hide. It's not something to be ashamed of. And so when this inevitably happens, it's normal to experience it, but when it does, that's why we have to stake our faith in the truth, not in our feelings. Um, Normally, After I talk about 
the general idea of what we're talking about for the evening, I would then transition into a time of why. So normally, if I was following my normal flow of a teaching, I would ask the question, okay, why do we feel like God is absent sometimes? And I would try to answer that for you. Um, but I don't want to do that tonight. Because in the passage, that question isn't answered. The psalmist does ask why, but he doesn't receive an answer. And honestly, because when you don't feel like God is close, when you don't feel like you have this warm, fuzzy connection like you're used to, there could be a million different reasons as to why that's going on. So I don't know your situation, and I'm not going to pretend to tell you why I, like, how I know why that's going on. Um, a lot of times we'll throw out fun answers for you, like uh, maybe it's because you're not reading your Bible enough, maybe it's because you're not praying him enough, you're not pursuing him, or maybe it's because you just didn't get enough sleep last night, or maybe you're experiencing spiritual warfare, or maybe he has another mysterious plan. I don't know the reason. And that's not the goal tonight of to figure out why sometimes God withdraws his felt presence from us, um, because he doesn't ever tell us why he does that. I do want us to consider, though, instead what we should do when that happens. Because I feel like when that does happen, we freak out and we don't know what to do and a lot of, a lot of things can go sideways really fast. So instead, um, what should we do when we don't feel God? When things feel dry, when he feels really, really quiet, what do we do? Well, the psalmist says a couple things. He prays really honestly. He tells the Lord how he feels. Um, he knows how he feels. Might as well tell him. He appreciates honest prayers. That's what a real relationship does. He preaches the truth to his feelings, which is what we just talked about. And sometimes, sometimes, when you pray how you feel, and then you preach the truth to yourself, sometimes those, those nice feelings of a felt presence of the Lord comes back. And then sometimes they don't. So if they don't, if you still feel like God is absent in your life, if you still don't feel his close presence anymore, what do you do? Because a lot of times, I think what happens is when you don't feel like God is near, you don't want to keep showing up anymore. That happened to me over the last year. There was a stretch there where every time I got up to read the Bible, it was just like, cool, great. And I love reading the Bible. I'm a big fan of the Bible. I spend a lot of time just being so excited. It sounds really dumb, but I used to be so excited to get up in the morning and spend time with the Lord and read my Bible because I knew he was going to meet me. And in this season, it has been more of a, okay, cool, and then just move on. And so eventually that got a little old, and so I wasn't really motivated anymore. And so there was a stretch where I just didn't anymore. I just relied on wherever I was reading the Bible and other areas of my life. So I didn't meet with him there. And let me tell you, <laughs> that doesn't work. That does not fix it. It just makes things worse, actually. So what do you do? You praise him anyways when you don't feel like praising him, when you don't think he's going to make his presence close and felt to you, you praise him anyways. You follow him anyways. You obey him anyways. When you don't want to follow him, you do it anyways. And sometimes when we choose to obey Jesus when we don't feel like it, and when we choose to worship Jesus when we don't feel like it, it feels really fake. And it feels like we shouldn't be doing it that way. It feels like that's wrong or not honoring to God. Let's use worship as an example. You can do this with anything, but let's use worship. Sometimes you come into the worship room and you don't feel like worshiping him that day. And if you're currently experiencing what it feels like to have God be really quiet or absent or dry in your life, the motivation to want to worship is even less. And so if I told you, if you were to, oh, my bad. If he, if you, if you, <laughs> if you decide, okay, I'm going to worship him anyways, and you worship the way you want to, so you're putting your hand up, whatever, but you don't feel anything, sometimes that feels really fake, and it feels like you're being a hypocrite, and it feels like that's something that God frowns upon. But that's actually not true at all. That is called a sacrifice of praise. That is called... Jesus is worthy regardless of how I feel, so I'm going to worship you anyways. Now, there is a way to worship him in a way that isn't honoring, and that would be like, I'm going to worship him even though I don't feel it, just so other people think I'm great. That's not great. 
But I'm saying if you walk in here and you don't necessarily feel like he's near, you don't have that emotional experience in worship that a lot of people have. Do you truly worship him? Do you give him everything that you have to offer or not? My encouragement is to do it anyways. Because, hold on, this is really bothering me. Okay. Because even when you don't feel like it, you have a really special opportunity to be faithful to Jesus even when you don't feel like it. When you feel like his presence hasn't been close, when you feel like he hasn't talked to you in a long time, you have a very rare opportunity in your faith to be faithful to Jesus just to be faithful to him. Not because you will get a single thing out of it, not because he will give you something, not because you'll get that instant gratification of a warm, fuzzy feeling, me and Jesus are so close right now. You have an opportunity to be faithful to him because you really believe he is who he says he is. So you can stand before him and say, I don't feel a thing. And I don't know why, but what I do know is that you are who you say you are, and I believe it, and I believe that you're worthy of my praise no matter how I feel. And even though it doesn't feel fun, and even though you don't feel very Christian, that is actually the kind of faith that Jesus loves. That's the kind of faith that he is amazed by in the Gospels. So that's what you should do. Follow him anyways. Don't neglect him. Follow him anyways. Remain faithful. And then there's another thing. God doesn't waste anything. Okay? We know that about the Lord. He does not waste a thing. He always has a plan and a purpose behind everything he does, whether or not we know it. And he always redeems broken things for really good, God-glorifying kingdom purposes. So he must actually be doing something whether or not you see it or feel it or hear it. Because our faith tends to be the first thing to go. When we don't feel like God is near, when we don't feel like God is close, when we feel like he's left us, when we feel like he has forgotten us, the first thing to go is my faith. So you ask those doubting questions. That's normal. But what I want to do is I want to encourage you today to consider what God could possibly be up to whenever it seems really quiet and really dry. Because whenever God is nor you're normally used to God being up on the stage and doing really fun, extravagant, big answered prayers, you have really sweet communion, it's warm and fuzzy and nice all the time, and you feel really Christian. Um, and then all of a sudden, he decides to slip behind the scenes. He's still working in your life. He's still speaking to you. He's still very much there, and he still very much thinks of you and cares about you. You're just experiencing it in a really, really different way. So my biggest bet on what God could possibly be up to when this is happening is your growth. Um, and I know what you're all thinking, that C.S. Lewis screw tape letters quote, the quote we've heard so much recently of the father caring for his little kid walking. I'm not going to make you read the whole quote because I feel like I've heard it too much recently. But to those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the quote is phenomenal. And basically C.S. Lewis is talking about this idea of whenever God withdraws his felt experience, of his presence. Like his presence is still there, but when he takes away your ability to feel him, sense him, like taste him, whatever, when he takes that all away, it's not purposeless. What he's doing is he's being a really good father and he's making his little kid learn how to walk on his own. And he talks about this idea of it's actually beautiful when you start to see a believer who doesn't feel God, doesn't sense God, doesn't see him, doesn't experience him like he's used to, and follows him anyways. That is where the biggest growth happens. He's never actually left you. He's actually sitting back, really loving watching you grow. So that's most likely what's going on whenever he seems to withdraw. It might be he's just encouraging you in your growth, making you look more like Jesus. This has happened a lot um, in my last year. Um, it's kind of a mixture of you don't feel like you're growing because it looks like nothing's going on because it looks like it's all really quiet. Um, but under the surface, there is a lot of work happening. So, for example, 
in the last year, I've been convicted of a lot of sin, which is never really fun. Um, it's just been like ever present before my face of like, wow, I am so much more evil than I ever thought. It goes so much deeper and so much wider than I could have possibly dared imagine. And although that's no fun either, it is teaching you that you need Jesus. My patience has grown, um, not necessarily with people, to be honest, but with the Lord. I've learned to wait on him and to not boss him around in my time with him because he has chosen, regardless of what I do, I've been put in a box. I cannot do anything. Name all the spiritual disciplines. I probably did it, okay? I can't do anything to make his felt experience come back. I can't do that right now. And so what I've learned is sometimes the Lord wants to commune with me, to speak with me, to talk with me and spend time with me on his own terms. And that is good. It's a good thing for him to do what he wants in my life. And I have to learn to trust that. And ironically, although my personal time with Jesus has been really, really dry, I have actually become more and more aware of him in my life. My awareness has sharpened. And it makes sense because if I'm talking really, really loud, you don't have to try really, really hard to hear me because I'm talking so loud. Can I get really, really, really quiet? You have to, you have to do, oh, what's she saying? And since he's grown so quiet, I've learned to be looking and listening for him constantly because I still care. I still want to hear from him. And so what's happened is actually in the last year, I have seen him all over my life. I see him providing for me every single day. I see him planning my future. I see him blessing me through y'all. Y'all, he has answered so many of my prayers in your life, constantly. It's just been beautiful. I see him everywhere. Just because whenever I meet with him personally, it's a little quiet, I still know he is very active, and I know that he still very much cares. And I think most importantly, and maybe my favorite thing, is my love for Jesus has really grown. It has deepened. It has gone from, I love Jesus. It has gone from, I love Jesus and the feelings he brings me, to, I have no feelings. But I actually really care about him. I actually really love him. Everything else has been slowly taken away, slowly, 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 in my personal time with him. He's just grown quiet, and I don't have anything else to rely on. And yet the one desire of my soul is to see his face one day. So that is what he might be up to in your life. Um, again, I'm not going to pretend like it's all, I feel like you know I'm not pretending like it's fun, because the growing process isn't always fun. Um, but when you look back later, it is pretty incredible how much he does. I've also learned that I cannot rely on my own strength. I cannot rely on anything that I have to offer him because I have no strength to flex. I cannot rely on my righteousness to prop me up in front of Jesus because I have seen it fail constantly. I have not had a thriving, colorful, personal relationship with Jesus that people love to hear and are inspired by. I haven't had that. And regardless of all of that, take that all away, I have never doubted that Jesus was by my side. Not once. I've always known that he was with me. And that's a kind of faith that I didn't have before. Um, I have a park that I like to go to um, to meet with God. And even in this last year, you know, normally it would be like, oh, man, I don't feel close to God. I'd go to the park, and then we'd meet, and it'd be great. Even when I go to my park, it's still really, really quiet. But it went from having really fun, I could tell the story later, and people would be really impressed, <laughs> to I'm talking to you, and you're not talking back, but I know you're sitting here right with me. And then sometimes you just sit there, and I've learned the goodness of just sitting in the presence of Jesus. I can't feel his presence at all. That little spidey sense that Christians have, don't have it. But I am more confident than I have ever been that he's been with me the entire time. So if you ever feel like he's not near, like he's not close, like his presence is left, 
It's not true. I promise you it's not true. I hope you don't feel shame over experiencing that. Um, And I encourage you just to trust him. Trust him with your dryness. Trust him with the winter. Because silently and slowly, underneath all the barrenness, something beautiful is growing. He's preparing you for something wonderful. You may not know what it is yet, but he is forming you and making you into just more of an image of Jesus, into someone who is more filled with love for, her, for his or her Savior, for your friends, your family, your neighbor around you. You are growing into something beautiful. You are growing into the masterpiece that you already are. Also, an encouragement, those times, those seasons are temporary. They are not permanent. They will come and go. You might experience multiple. I don't know how it works. I'm not really a professional in this. But they are temporary. Um, I have one final thought to leave you. Actually, yeah, I have one quick side note. Sometimes, some of you might be thinking, God feels far, but you've never actually pursued him before. And you might just need to learn how to pursue him. You might just need to actually read your Bible. But I'm saying when you are still pursuing him and it still feels like he's far away, I promise that it's only temporary. Okay, my side of the side. Final thought. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry day by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be counted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Matthew 27. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. When we feel like God isn't close, or like God has left us or forsaken us, it is temporary, and it's only a feeling. We never actually experience that, though. We don't ever actually experience him leaving us or forsaking us. Only Jesus actually experienced that. He didn't experience a dry or an empty or a cold or a quiet feeling. He actually experienced God turning his face away. He actually experienced being forsaken by his father. He actually experienced receiving the penalty of all of our sins on him and bearing the wrath of God. He actually experienced it. So that you can stand in confidence regardless of your feeling, and say, I know my God is with me. I know that I will be faithful to him because he is worthy, because Jesus has actually done this for me. And I'm not saying your feelings aren't relevant because Jesus did more. I'm saying you're in really good company 
because you're in the presence of your Savior King who actually left the presence of God to bring you into it for forever. So, when you don't feel God's presence like you're used to, I encourage you, just like the psalmist says, don't despair, don't be cast down, don't lose hope. Hope in your salvation, hope in your God. Let's pray. Father, I am grateful that you are faithful through every season. That you never waste a thing. And I'm grateful that you would never leave us or forsake us, and you have never once forgotten us. Lord, I pray that you would encourage the spirits of those who are currently experiencing dryness or feel like you have grown quiet or are worried that you have left them. Lord, would you encourage their hearts again and remind them that you have never left them, you have never forsaken them, they are not condemned because of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would be a community of believers that have real faith regardless of how we feel. I pray that we will bank on your promises and the finished work of Jesus. Lord, I pray that our hearts and our lives will be honoring to you. Would you continue to shape us to look and live more like Jesus? Would our faith be honoring to you? And Lord, I pray for those who are weary that you've been quiet, that you would speak to them again, that you would lead them out of winter and into spring. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.